Hey, Gathering family, welcome to a special edition q and I'm here with Caleb, one of our interns, and we are going to talk about some questions that you have been asking. And so first of all, thank you for continuing to bombard our ministry with questions. We're excited uh, certainly to kick off again next week, September 17th. Doors will open here at 6.30. We're going to be back, and we've got more information on that. Um, but first, Caleb, welcome, man. You want to share a little bit about what you do here at uh, the church and with the gathering? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Costa, for having me up here. Yeah. Um, some of the things I do here at the church is, I don't know if you guys, some of you know, but I actually intern with Costa here. I also work for Norma, and um, I also work for our tech guy, Daniel, who does basically all the AV stuff and just um, all the videos that has been posted on our Instagram page, Facebook page, Twitter, and YouTube. They, he's done it all, basically. Cool. Well, man, I'm excited to have you. Yeah, so you do janitorial with Norma, yes. tech and AV uh, with Daniel, and then with me, we just do crazy stuff and fun yeah. stuff. So right on. Well, I'm thankful for you, proud of you, and appreciate all that you do here. And thanks for moderating with me. Yeah. Uh, Caleb is going to be reading off the different questions. We've got five main ones for tonight. But before we jump in, let me go ahead and pray for us. Pray for you. Pray for God's word to permeate the Q&A. That's really where our best answers come from. And then I'll update you on next week as a reminder, and we'll dig in. Father, thank you for the chance to talk about your word tonight. Thank you for our teens and college students who have questions and actually want to know how they might live for you in today's world. Uh, thank you for Caleb and his labor here at the church, uh, for the opportunity to have interns and to have uh, a ministry that is raising up the next generation. All that is a gift from you and you alone. So help us to steward it. Uh, grant me wisdom tonight from your word as we answer these questions, knowing that that is the main source of wisdom for our life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so reminder next week, 6.30 p.m., the doors open here at our campus at Redeemer Bible Church, and then 7 p.m., the service will start. The way it's going to go, we're going to worship, we'll sing together, um, I'm going to preach, we're going to keep going in our First John series, and then we've got a special uh, sort of event or fun thing after. We've got a food truck coming called Waffle Love, so it's waffle dessert crazy stuff. There's Nutella things on the menu and all that. So uh, the gathering is treating you. So invite a friend, uh, bring the whole family, whatever, after 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. It'll sort of be a, a bit of an all you can eat. Uh, and as much as you think you can eat of waffles and Nutella, there'll be a limit. I'm, I'm sure that people will fill up yeah. and just be done. Uh, and then everyone go home have a sugar crash, and then wake up the next morning ready for school. So next Thursday, 8 to 9 p.m. after the service, we'll have the food truck out on the curb. Uh, another thing to remind you of is uh, our, our venue here. We've got a lot of safety measures in place, sanitization stations. People will be wearing masks who want to wear masks, and that's great. And some families and students don't, so they won't. And all of that is well and good. I just want you here and for you to feel comfortable. There's plenty of space and plenty of opportunities for everyone to stay safe and stay comfortable. Uh, our gymnasium will be open. We'll have some good seating areas as well. And then the last thing is for you parents who've been wondering, how does this all work? You're newer to the church and you're wondering, you know, for different age groups, how we operate. Um, the gathering has a wide demographic. We're running about seventh grade, and then we actually have ministry all the way up to college students, including a, a, a young adult college a small group that meets during the week. And so here's how it goes. We'll worship together. And then initially for the first several weeks, we're gonna finish our first John series. And we've got plenty of leaders who break out with the young people and talk with them and hang out. But I can tell you this, several weeks out from us regathering, we do have a very exciting plan where the younger age groups and the different age groups are gonna start to have their own venues. And so for those of you parents wondering uh, what is available for your seventh and eighth grader or how is the, the, you know, the 10th grader is gonna fit in and where and how, we've got big plans and they're all geared towards discipleship mm -hmm. and good age specific ministry. So more to come on that, some really special surprises courtesy of our amazing team who are doing a lot. So. Uh, on that note, Caleb, let's go, man. Hi. Right. Kasi, first question is, should I be friends with a person if they sexed me? Okay. Should I be friends with a person if they sexted me is the word. So um, 
for those of you that maybe you've not heard that, or, or this is a concept you're going, what in the world? Um, someone who's sexting, these are questions from our teenagers here, uh, are inappropriate text messages. That's the word that they're using. It's not texting, it's sexting. It's inappropriate, it's something that's impure, it's not proper language, it's not appropriate, okay? That's what's being asked. Uh, here's the answer. So should you be friends with a person who does that? The answer is no. Yeah. Uh, not unless they repent, they confess that sin. It is sin, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, and then if there's continued accountability with both sets of parents, mm -hmm. and then both sets of parents, especially if you're a teenager and you're in your parents' home still, those parents need to talk about that. They need to approve of the communication being reengaged. Uh, I get it. We get it. Young people, they sin. They do things. Nobody's perfect. People make mistakes. They slip up. Whatever the term is, sin is sin. And we mm -hmm. talked about that recently in the First yes. John series. But the reality is uh, parents have to be involved. There has to be accountability. There's no room for carrying on in friendships uh, with no accountability and all that. Uh, a couple of stats for you. On any given week, young people, you will spend an average of seven and a half hours with friends or engaged in some sort of school activity. I know there's COVID and some of those numbers might be different, but for the most part, uh, those hours will include four hours of leisure, sports, social media use, and, and general just hanging out. People just hang, do nothing, I get it. 85% uh, of you are gonna use YouTube, 72% of, of you are gonna use Instagram, 69% Snapchat, that's not even including TikTok and all these other crazy things going on. 83% um, of your time is going to be spent with friends in some sort of school setting. 58% uh, at their houses or yours. 55% of your interactions will be through text or social media. 45% through hobbies. 23% at coffee shops. And only 21% at church. So a huge percentage of time yeah. being spent with friends. And so you need to realize this. Uh, you are who you hang around with. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You really need to be keen on who you're hanging out with. There's no room for any type of uh, you know, sexting, texting, all that stuff that's inappropriate. Here are some passages that you can look at. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul says, So whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, that type of behavior, uh, that heart, that sin is not glorifying God. Uh, another one, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 to 7, Paul says, for you know what instructions we gave you from the Lord, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that's a big word, just your purity, your growth, your holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality. We've talked about that, we've done different messages about purity and relationships, and you need to know how to control your own body, your own holiness, Paul says. Uh, sexting is immorality, it's uh, behavior that's not becoming of a Christian. It's giving into the passion of lust. And Paul basically says, that's not God's will. His will is not impurity, but holiness. There's uh, another thing I do want to add here, and this is the last thing on this particular question. Uh, you need to run from whatever compromises your purity. The Bible doesn't say, tinker with it, uh, entertain it, Say, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, we're just kidding. The Bible doesn't say mess around with that. The Bible says literally run. And here's where it says that. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 19, Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. So that's going to mean throw your cell phone out the window if it's mm -hmm. causing you to sin. Confess it to your parents. Uh, break your laptop. Break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Cancel a date. Uh, delete a number, block someone, leave a restaurant, run. Literally run away from anything that is causing immorality in your life. Mm. It's not worth it. You need to confess it and go to the Lord. So that would be my answer to should I still be friends with a person if they sexted me? The answer is no, unless they repent, confess the sin, Parents get involved, there's restoration, and then there's accountability. Now, you might say, well, I'm a college student. I, I, I'm 21 years old or 20 years old. I'm listening to this, and I, I, I don't have parents. I'm not going to call someone's parents and get them involved. Then you need to go to a pastor. You're an adult. You're a church member now, an adult church member. You need mm -hmm. to go to your pastor. Uh, if it's you, you're in our ministry, you need to come to me or one of our leaders, and you need to tell us what's going on, and then we need to talk. We need to make that right. 
We need to put accountability measures in place and then move forward. And you need to be real careful with those people that are causing you to sin. Mm, amen, Kasi. Uh, next question is, how do you deal with friends or siblings you who is not a Christian? Mm. That's part one. Part two is, how can you help him or her? Okay. So how do you deal with a friend or sibling who's not a Christian? And how can you help him or her? Uh, first, I would say see this as the greatest opportunity you could possibly have, not a big burden or this is so annoying or why do I have to do this? Because you have a great opportunity when you're in the same house as someone. It's fun. It's a blessing. It's a joy because you think, wow, how many people they wish they could reach their friends, but they're only with their friends a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Now imagine you wake up every day and there's a person in your house that you can reach. And so see yes. this as a great blessing, even though it seems a little crazy to, to think of a, an unbelieving brother or sister yeah. as a blessing, you have direct access to them and God can use you greatly mm -hmm. in their life. So that would be one thing. I think perspective is where it starts. Um, I think you probably already have that perspective since you're asking this question, you wanna know. So what I want you to do, turn in your Bible to Jude, the book of Jude, verse 17 to 23. Jude doesn't have a bunch of chapters. It, it really doesn't have a chapter at all. So you just say Jude, the book of Jude, and then you just say verse 17 to 23. I'm gonna read this to you guys, and this will have some wisdom for how to deal with people who are unbelievers or maybe they believe the wrong things in your life. Uh, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. So he's saying divisive people, false teachers, false believers, unbelievers, dangerous people, they're ungodly. Um, they can be divisive. They don't have the Spirit. And he says, but you, beloved, in verse 20, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others, snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Okay, verses 21, 22, 23, all right there. Help us categorize how we should be approaching friends and family who are unbelievers, or maybe they believe things that are not very helpful. Um, Jude says in 22, have mercy on those who doubt. So there's this group, they're the doubters. They're not really sure about their faith. Yeah. Be merciful. The last thing you want as a brother or sister of somebody who's not a believer is to come off mean and them to say to you, oh, some Christian you are. Wow, my sister, my brother, you know, oh, you say you're such a Christian. You know, if only your church saw the way you treat me. If only your church saw just how nice of a sister you really are behind the scenes. You're a hypocrite. You don't want to hear that because you're being merciful. You're being loving. So you want to operate in a way that is merciful. Um, the next thing that he says is we should save others, save people, snatching them out of the fire. And what that means is these people are in danger spiritually. We need to view it as a rescue operation. And so if you haven't already, have that moment with a brother or sister where you say, hey, I love you. Your soul is in danger. The way you're going right now, you're not repenting of sin. You don't believe in Jesus. You don't have faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. You're on your way to hell. Mm -hmm. I want you to be in heaven even more. I want to serve the Lord with you now. Repent of your sin. Believe in Jesus. You want to go in and try to snatch them, so to speak, out of the fire, out of the, the literally a burning inferno one day of hell. But right now, that's signifying their life in darkness. They're not going the right direction. And then Jude says one more thing. Uh, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. In specific context, he's talking about false teachers that are really dangerous. He says, have mercy on them, but with fear, meaning you keep an arm's length. That can be still applied mm. to some unbelieving family members, a brother or sister, a sibling, who are really dangerous. Maybe they're doing drugs. Maybe they're uh, consuming alcohol. Maybe they are uh, doing immoral things and your parents are out of the house and they're doing those things and, and you don't know what to do. Mm. Uh, keep a healthy distance. Be very careful that you don't get caught up in what they're doing or potentially hurt by them 
or someone who's involved in what they're doing. And so you want to still be merciful, still be loving, but you want to be really careful. Uh, The last place I want to take you guys is Colossians chapter 4. So go over to Colossians chapter 4. Turn in your Bible back there a little bit before 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, um, just after the book of Philippians. So Colossians chapter 4, there's this section that is really helpful for us when we're talking about how to operate with unbelievers. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer in verse 2, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us that God will open doors for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on the account of which I'm in prison. He's basically saying, I am in prison. Pray for open doors for the gospel. Pray that we get a chance to share the gospel. So right there, pray for opportunities to share the gospel with a sibling. Then this, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So there's another thing. Be really clear about the gospel. Make sure you're not mincing words. And then, verse five, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Basically, you need to be gracious in the way you talk. You need to be seasoned with salt. That's flavoring their life, flavoring the conversation. Um, being full of taste or tasteful in the Lord, which is going to be bringing a rich message. That's Mm -hmm. the gospel. So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You ought to be praying, God, what do you want me to say to this person in my family, this brother or sister? How can I approach them? Look at God's word and approach them that way. So that would be really um, how I would answer, how do you deal with a friend or a sibling who's not a Christian? How can you help him or her? Of course, I've applied this quite extensively to people in your home. A a friend would be outside your home, but you can apply all those principles to a friend when you're at school with them, when you're on the phone with them, when you're on social media. But Colossians 4, 2 through 6, a passage I want you guys to remember, maybe put a bookmark in your Bible or highlight it as a passage that teaches us how we should be talking to other people in our life who aren't believers. Thank you, Kasi. Yeah. The next question is, I am struggling with my dark sense of humor influenced by social media. What's too far? Good question. Thank you for your honesty uh, about your dark sense of humor and social media being the influence of that. So uh, another passage. I want to we're gonna study the Bible together. So go to Ephesians chapter 4. I go back, you'll run into Philippians, and then back one more, and we'll end up in Ephesians. So Ephesians 4, verse 29. Okay, Ephesians 4, verse 29. If you're struggling with a dark sense of humor, and you, you tend to joke maybe in crude ways, or, you know, I don't know, nasty, weird sense of humor stuff, dirty jokes, and all that, I, I get it. You know, some of the young people think it's funny, and and there's movies that do it, and shows that do this, and social media does this. So uh, Ephesians 4.29, to believers, okay, we're different. That's why I always say you guys are weird, right? Be weird. Embrace weird. Mm. Um, This is one of the ways that we're going to be a little weird in the world. Ephesians 4.29, hope you're there. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay, so can you make funny jokes? Yes. Uh, can you be a little funny or a little sassy sometimes or, or, or have sort of a funny, you know, sarcastic moment in some ways? Sure, there's some points where Paul was sarcastic in the Bible or you say, um, you know, I don't know, if, if we're playing sports or something like that and, and Caleb, you know, blazes past me and uh, scores a layup, you know, and I'm, I might chirp him back and say, oh, all right. And you're like, oh, yeah, I guess two nothing then, Pastor, huh? And I'm like, oh, yeah. All right, man, you want to play? We're going to play. I'm going to bring. There's like funny banter, you know, athletic banter, or competitive banter. Or we, we razz each other sometimes. That's all done with a mutual understanding of love a mutual understanding of context. But that doesn't fit in this. Mm -hmm. What Paul is referring to is corrupting talk, things that don't build up, 
They crush, they shatter. Uh, Things that aren't mutually funny in that sense, Mm. where we're having good, wholesome fun that the Lord is even pleased with and seeing is this is still God-honoring and it's still just Christians laughing together. No, he's saying this grieves the Holy Spirit. It's something that does not fit the occasion. Uh, It's making the wrong joke at the wrong time, the wrong way. Uh, It's taking an opportunity to build someone up and putting them down. Mm -hmm. And so we want to always be careful with corrupting talk. The question was dark sense of humor, influenced by social media. Uh, I see things on social media or other places, dark sense of humor, uh, jokes about death in certain ways, Uh, jokes about doing things to people or things done by people, Mm. Uh, jokes about different things that really have no place and they can hurt a lot of feelings. And so we don't need to be joking about a lot of violence, joking about earlier we talked about sexual immorality, inappropriate things. We don't need to be joking about cutting people down or really uh, slamming their looks or making a lot of fun of them with the purpose of building ourselves up. Mm -hmm. That breaks them down. Uh, Another place I want to take you real quick is James chapter 3, speaking of the way that we use our mouths. And uh, we did a sermon series on some things about the Bible, what the Bible says about. And one of the sermon messages were uh, what the Bible says about taming the tongue. And I dealt with this passage. But I want to remind you what James says in James 3, 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Hey, so if you can control your mouth, you could pretty much control everything. (laughs) You're going to be perfect, which we know none of us are. It's hard to control our mouths. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they will obey us, we guide their whole body. So if you control the mouth, you control the body. Look at ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It's set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell." For every kind of beast, James says, and bird and reptile of the sea can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. What's James' point? You're hopeless? Forget it? Say what you want because you'll never be perfect? No. His point is the tongue is dangerous. Know that it's dangerous. Understand that it's dangerous. And then pray. Go to God. Uh, Don't just be, well, whatever. He says, go in verse 13 and see who is wise and understanding. You'll see that by his good conduct and the works of meekness. He's saying, go and be wise. Be wise with your mouth. Be wise with your ways, the way you act, and realize that the tongue is a restless evil. So I would go to God's word, get the dark sense of humor and the social media coarse jesting and aggressive language uh, in check and bring your mouth under the control of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Amen. Uh, don't, a, don't a sweet old lady go to the same place as Hitler? Stalin. Stalin. That's Stalin. Stalin and Mo. Mao. Mao. Yep. Simply because she is not a Christian. Hey, that's a good question. Does a sweet old lady go to the same place as Hitler, Stalin? Have you learned a lot about Stalin yet? I've actually never heard of that. All right, so history. He was a really evil dictator, uh, a a bad guy. And then Mao was an... These are some cruel Mm -hmm. leaders. You've heard of Hitler? Yeah, I've heard of Hitler. So they were all kind of like that in in one sense or another. Mm -hmm. Uh, Does a sweet old lady who doesn't believe in Jesus is really, I think, what you're asking, go to the same place if she's not a Christian? Um... Okay, time for a little Bible tour. I wrote a few passages down that come to mind. John 14, 6. Let's go there first, okay? John 14, 6. Uh, I, I don't even need to turn there, but if you, if you don't know that passage, I want you to go there, okay? So that you can memorize it and get this memorized like maybe your parents or, or I do or one of our team leaders have. This is a passage that 
Uh, all Christians need to memorize. Okay, I'm saying that. So if you haven't, it's not to make you feel guilty or ashamed. That's to tell you this is the one you put in the back pocket and it's always there. John 14, 6, Jesus says, uh, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pretty simple, right? I'm the way, the truth, the life. So, first things first. The old lady doesn't go to heaven. Uh, and neither does Hitler and Stalin and Mao or anyone else if they're an unbeliever. Not because they killed a bunch of people, not because, the, you know, and she was so good. Why does she go? It's not about good works or bad works. It's about believing in Jesus. If you don't go through Jesus, you're not going to heaven. There's no way to the Father but through him. So Jesus is the only way. That would be truth number one that I want you to understand. And we're going to build a little framework here before we dig in to the actual answer where we'll get to. I think you're asking, uh, are there different degrees of mercy even? Uh, so go to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3 and go to verse 23. Romans 3.23. Another passage I'd like you to work on memorizing for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Very simple. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The basic thing is the woman who is a sweet old lady and who doesn't believe in Jesus is a sinner who has not repented of sin, who has fallen short and missed the mark of the glory of God. So is Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. So that truth is clear. Turn over another page or so to Romans 6, 23. So Romans 3, 23 all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Simple truth again. The wages of sin, all sin. Unrepentant heart of the old sweet lady, that's still sinful. That's not believing in Jesus. Uh, evil, wicked men who are dictators and have uh, piled up bodies in streets, killing innocent people, the wages of their unrepented sin is still death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Here's the bottom line. Even if a murderer repents, they can go to heaven through Jesus Christ and his mercy and his grace. If the old sweet lady repents, She'll go to heaven, yeah. believing in Jesus Christ. All of those are realities. Um, however, there is some good evidence, and I want to read you a few uh, thoughts, and you can write these passages down, that give credence to different degrees of punishment in hell or on the day of wrath. That doesn't mean that anyone is going to heaven because they were good or not going to heaven because they were bad. You're going to hell or heaven based on believing in Jesus Christ, whether or not you have faith. But once in hell, varying degrees of punishment or what will be unleashed are clear in the Bible. Um, in Romans 2, 5, the Apostle Paul says, because of your hard and impenitent heart, not penitent, impenitent, I mean, basically, you're not very humble and broken before the Lord. You don't really care. You are storing up for yourself on the day of wrath uh, wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So there's a righteous judgment that's going to be revealed. Uh, Romans 2, 5 talks about that. Romans 2, all the way run through 11 is the whole section. Um, there are different sins that we see in the Old Testament, uh, different sinful cultures that are treated differently. For example, in the Old Testament, you've heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah were consumed by fire. And yet others were just unbelievers or not the people of God who just lived to be old and died. So God's judgment revealed through that. Um, but here's the interesting passage that I, I want to point out, and I like pointing this one out. In Matthew 11, Jesus sees unbelief or a rejection of something, his ministry. And he says this, uh, basically as bad as Sodom was, so being consumed by fire, her sentence will be lighter on judgment day than Bethsaida's because they saw Jesus and still didn't believe. They rejected Jesus and they saw him. There will be greater degrees of judgment for those who saw the Lord, tasted his works, witnessed his works, and still rejected him. See, Sodom and Gomorrah never saw Jesus 
But Bethsaida saw Jesus. Yeah. And so he's saying basically there will be a more intense punishment. Uh, other places in the New Testament I say it's better to have not even tasted it. The author of Hebrews basically says that. Better not even to have tasted the goodness of God, the kindness of God, and then mm-hmm. really walked away, rejected it, ended up being an unbeliever. Mm-hmm. Better to be just an unbeliever who never even saw it yeah. than to have tasted it. Mm-hmm. There are higher degrees of judgment. Um, last two places I would turn you to would be the book of Jude, which we were already in, and then Second Peter chapter 2. That whole chapter is about false teachers. There's some phrases there that those authors use that could denote uh, that some of the darkest or hottest places in hell, literally, the, the, the utter gloom of darkness that has been reserved forever are for false teachers. And so there are certainly some scholars who believe that false teachers will have some of the greatest degrees of judgment of all because they took the name of Christ and used it to lead people to hell into a false version of Christ. They took the gospel and spat on it, basically. And so, uh, very important for us to see that. So, as hard as it might be to accept the fact that an old lady who didn't repent but was a nice old lady Mm -hmm. and Adolf Hitler are both going to hell, that may be a hard truth to accept. You can understand that based on what the Bible teaches, her judgment in hell may be a lighter judgment, if you will, uh, not a higher degree of judgment than those who uh, were uh, wild rejecters of Christ or those who saw the work of God and rejected or false teachers or others. And so I hope that helps shed some light. Uh, If you're looking for kind of one main takeaway, believe in Jesus, okay? Repent and follow Christ and this question becomes a non-factor in your life. Hmm. Amen. Final question. How do you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you? All right. Final question. <laughs> this one. So I, this one fires me up. Hmm. I, let me, I want to check out what our time is at. I don't know. Um, we're doing okay. I'm, I'll try to answer this one quickly, but still with respect to what the Bible says. So you're going to hear sometimes preachers or people say, God told me. Or, hey, the Holy Spirit told me. Or, man, as clear as I'm sitting with you right now, Caleb, God, I feel like he's telling me, you know, I feel it in my soul that he's telling me. So here's the thing that I would say. No matter how well-intentioned someone Mm. might might be, like they're just trying to share what's in their heart, they're really excited. You feel with your emotions, okay? You hear with your ears, Mm -hmm. and you think with your brain. So... I don't ever feel like God told me. I feel emotions, and then I hear if God told me. Or I I think a thought. I think a thought. I I didn't hear God in my brain. I thought a thought. So I think we want to categorize properly what we're talking about. So how do you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you? Well, first we need to understand uh, what it looks like to, quote, hear from God or to be led by the Holy Spirit. And so... um, Romans 8, 14 says, they that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. In other words, there's people who, we are the children of God. You're gonna be led by the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? I would send you to another place, which is John chapter 16. You know what? Let's turn there. Let's go to John 16, okay? And as we go there, I'm gonna explain the context of what's happening. Jesus is sharing the Holy Spirit's job description. He's explaining what he's gonna do. And in John chapter 16, He basically says that he's going to guide you, he's talking to his disciples, into truth. John 16, he says, Now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? This is verse 5 of John 16. He goes on to say, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage, in verse 7, that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I'll send him to you. He's saying it's better. If I go, the Holy Spirit's coming. You're going to have help. This is great news. And he says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So you're going to feel the Holy Spirit's work inside of you. It doesn't mean you're hearing God talking, but you're going to feel like the Holy Spirit is working through conviction. Yeah. That's a feeling. Mm-hmm. You start to feel guilt or you go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. Your conscience kind of pricks you or pokes you and you're going, oh, I probably shouldn't do this. That's some of the work of the Spirit, that He convicts us. Uh, 
He now uses different things. For example, when you hear teaching at church or your parents say, don't do that, and then you go, oh, I better not do this. They told me not to. The Holy Spirit is working through their instruction to convict you. So that's how you might know that you're hearing, quote, or being led by the Holy Spirit through conviction. Jesus says he's going to convict the world concerning sin, which means all people, quote, hear, but really feel Mm. conviction from the Holy Spirit. Now they say, oh, I feel like God is telling me not to do this, right? There we are again with feeling, and he's telling me. And basically, we should probably just say, I feel such strong conviction from the Holy Spirit right now. It's a better way to say it. Hmm. Um, so we're not confusing ourselves or others. Like God is, you know, hey, Caleb, don't do that. He's not. It's yes. internal. It's conviction. Hmm. He also says, I still, in verse 12, have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. It Directly, Jesus is telling the disciples the Holy Spirit is going to come, and he's going to guide them into all truth. They're going to write scripture, no doubt. They're going to need the Holy Spirit, who is the one who breathed basically to them or through them, through their pens. That would be called verbal plenary inspiration. Basically, it's simple. Uh, 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17 says, all scripture is God-breathed. Okay, the Holy Spirit moved through men, through their pen, but God was breathing scripture. Jesus is talking certainly about that or including that in this description. But if we just took it as a broad principle or a broad truth, the Holy Spirit doesn't guide into error. He doesn't guide into lies. He guided the disciples into truth, so certainly now he's not going to lead us anywhere else but into the truth, the truth being God's revealed word. So how do you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you? Well, read the Bible. If you read God's word, you have God's will. If you are filling your heart and your mind with God's word, you are filling your heart and your mind with what the Holy Spirit is revealed as truth. Mm -hmm. So now you have truth in your life. And so how do you know that? It's simple. It's in the Bible. Uh, Another thing that I would say is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, and let's talk about those thoughts. If you say, well, how do I know though? I, I get some thoughts sometimes, Costi. I think some things and I, I feel like those thoughts are put in my head by God. So isn't he talking to me? Isn't he like yeah. saying something to me? Here's a simple verse that explains what is happening. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 to 16, he says, for who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, somehow internally, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God, that is the, the Holy Spirit now. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So he's using spiritual terms here to describe believers and non-believers. Now don't miss this, verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly, foolishness to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Paul just said basically the gospel, the things of God, Mm. spiritual truths are total foolishness. They're ridiculous to the natural person. Natural would be carnal or an unbeliever or the fleshly side, not the the part of us that loves God and believes in God Mm -hmm. or not the type of person that loves God and believes in God, but a natural person. You go out on the street right now. You tell somebody, repent of your sin, believe in Jesus. They're gonna go, you're nuts, and they're gonna keep going. He's saying the things of the Spirit of God, they're crazy to those kind of people. But for us, we are able to understand them. He says, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. And then verse 16, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. There it is. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. He has taken residence in our hearts. And then we have the mind of Christ. Mm. And so you have a couple of 
things here that are important. Ephesians 5.18 tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Basically, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you as a believer, Caleb, and me. So I have God living inside of me. I'm told that I have the mind of Christ if I'm a Christian. And that Romans 8.14, I'm led by the Spirit if I'm one of the children of God. So isn't it possible that the thoughts that I think are in line with my Savior? Wouldn't it be possible that the thoughts that I think when my mind is richly filled with his word are perfectly in line with his word? So I think a thought one day. I wake up and I think of you, Caleb, and I'm like, man, I'm praying for Caleb. I, gotta, I, should, I should call Caleb today and see how he's doing. And you're like, man, that was perfect timing. I had a really rough day yesterday. And you called me and I'm like, man, yeah, the Lord put you on my heart. You're on my mind. I might say something like that, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean God said, Costi, call Caleb. It's simple. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We're part of his body. I have the mind of Christ and so do you. Mm -hmm. I simply operate and live according to God's word. If I think of another believer, I I reach out to that believer. Mm -hmm. I don't go, God told me to call you, Caleb. I'm just operating in that way. So it's it's really simple. Mm -hmm. We complicate it by saying, God told me, God told me, God told me, God told me. He's already told us that we're to bear one another's burdens. He's already told us the Holy Spirit's inside of us, convicting us, guiding us into truth. He's already told us that we have the mind of Christ. And so it's real simple. I might say, hey, Caleb, you know, you came to mind, or you were on my mind. I was thinking about you, and I just thought I'd call you and pray for you. It happened to be that the Lord used that. Or, hey, John, you know, I, I, I was thinking last night about all that you do, and uh, it, you just you were on my mind, man. I'm praying for you. How you doing? It's perfect timing, right? That's God doing all that. Mm-hmm. So how do you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you? Well, fill your mind and heart with God's word, and then when you have thoughts or desires about the church and people in the church, or serving in the church, or uh, caring for someone in the church, do that. You're mm-hmm. a Christian. You're operating with the mind of Christ, with the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so, yeah, sometimes people will say God told me because they're trying to validate their decision Mm. or they're a little insecure. And they don't just want to say they're doing something. They want to say God told me to do it so then everyone will be okay with it. Mm -hmm. We just need to simply say uh, I'm going to do this or this was on my mind or this was on my heart. Simple as that, man. Mm. Thank you, Kasi. Yeah, well, that, the, that wraps up our Q&A. Those were uh, longer answers, but a great series of questions from you guys. Uh, we're gonna put up on the screen right now the QR code. If you have questions, take a cell phone photo of the code that's on your screen, and then a form's gonna pop up. You gotta take a photo with one of those apps, a QR code app. A form will pop up. Send us a question. We'll answer it. And don't forget, we're back next week with more, and I'm looking forward to digging in with you. So... I love you guys. Thankful. Thanks for being here, Caleb. Thank you, Kasi. Appreciate you, brother. And I pray that you guys will continue to fill your minds and hearts with God's word.